Joe, he excelled in the Navy as a microwave telecom troubleshooter. Mr. Dollar has spent much of his life studying the works of Nikola Tesla, Sifu Simons, J.J. Thompson, and others in great depth. He is the author of several significant books on electrical theory. He has constructed and restored a number of extraordinary devices based on Tesla and Alexanderson's research. Eric Dollar currently provides consultant services to the electric utilities. Please welcome Eric Dollar. Yeah. the history. So you don't have to redo all the experiments over the past two or three hundred years. 
So go to the next shot. Okay, now we have Plato. So our best method of thinking comes from two people, Plato, and then we have following him, we have Aristotle. So Plato's thinking was, was to produce schemes more or less independent of existence on the basis of all being, and they were totalitarian in nature. For Aristotle, is the systematic experience of the surrounding universe, truth attained progressively through the work of individual efforts. Now, Oliver Heaviside breaks this down a little further in the concept of natural philosophy. All these people, Heaviside, Maxwell, Thompson, everybody that we're going to be talking about considered themselves a natural philosopher. It's a mode of thinking that doesn't really exist anymore today. Now, Heaviside broke the natural philosophy down into two terms. Those are the vitalists, which dealt with the living world, and that of the materialists, which dealt with the non-living world, which, of course, is us as electrical engineers. Now we can find the basic beginnings of science out of Aristotle's thought, but it had to be modified by an English Franciscan friar by the name of Ockham, 1350. He broke tradition with medieval thinking around 1350 and to be called the father of modern science. His line of reasoning led to Copernicus, then Galileo, and Kepler. The mode of thinking was now how instead of why. Descartes, in the 1600s, continued the line of reasoning and developed the first concept of the ether, which is the most important concept in dealing with electricity. Descartes regarded a metaphysics beyond the physical. He called it the last part to be studied as it is necessary to have previous knowledge of many things. The study of electricity, considering the electric phenomenon as non-physical, is hereby, by Descartes' reasoning, a metaphysical and not a physical study. This is the, the center of the whole problem. This electricity is not the place for physicists. Okay, now Erasmus, in 1509, gave a basic description of pre-Descartes thinking, which basically is where we are back again today. He said, there are innumerable niceties concerning notions, relations, instance and formalities, which no one can pry into unless they have eyes that can penetrate the thickest darkness, and there can see things that have no existence whatsoever. The very state that Erasmus complains of in 1509 has been reborn in the concepts of relativity and what I refer to as quantum mysticism. Tesla states, the scientists from Franklin to Morse were clear thinkers and did not produce erroneous theories. Scientists today think deeply instead of clearly. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane. Today, scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. It's a pretty heavy statement for Tesla to make. Now, Edwin Armstrong, after being ripped off by RCA for his FM invention, really summed up the, con the concept the best with the phrase, they substitute words for reality and then talk about the words. Heaviside gives his idea on what science is, is really about in his era. Very complicated uh, statements. There is no self-contained theory possible apart from practical meaning. For a language is used in its enunciation, which implies that developed ideas and complicated processes of thought are already in existence besides the general experience associated therewith. We define things in a phrase using words. These words hail to be explained by other words and so on forever in a complicated maze. There is no bottom to anything. We all get to body ends and upside down. The misinterpretation of J.J. Thompson's discovery of the electron greatly hampered the understanding of electricity. And in 1900, Simon summarizes the situation in one of his books. He says, unfortunately, to a large extent in dealing with the dielectric field, the prehistoric conception of the electrostatic charge on the conductor still exists, and thereby its use destroys the analogy between the two components of the electric field, the magnetic and the dielectric, and make the consideration of the dielectric field unnecessarily complicated. Naturality eliminates the dielectric field. 
and it makes it so that you can't calculate it and substitutes electron flow in its place. Wires are not conductors of electricity. This misconception of so-called conductors or wires carrying electricity like water in a pipe was continuously attacked by Heaviside in his writings. The entire article is written on the matter title, title A Perfect Conductor is a Perfect Obstructor, but does not absorb the electromagnetic energy of the waves. Heaviside states, it was discovered by mathematical reasoning that when an electric current is started in a wire, it begins entirely in its skin, in fact, upon the outside of the skin, and that, in consequence, sufficiently rapidly impressed fluctuations of the current keep to the skin of the wire and do not sensibly penetrate its interior. The concept of electron flow in wires rather than electrical field flow around the wires can be related to seeing the footprints of the invisible man in the snow. Edison says now, very few, if any, mathematical electricians, he's writing this in about 1890, very few, if any, mathematical electricians can understand this fact. Many of them neither understand it or believe it. Even many who do believe it so do not, do not because they are told so, I believe, simply because they can at least feel positive about the truth of their own knowledge. An eminent practitioner remarked after prolonged skepticism, if Sir Thompson says so, who can doubt it? What a world of worldly wisdom lies in that remark. That's heavy science quote. The relativists with their concept of distorted measurement or curved space replacing an ether and their concept of the equivalency of matter and energy work great harm into electrical sciences. A post-Maxwellian theory of electromagnetism was to prevail, ignoring the works of Tesla and J.J. Thomson. Tesla states, for more than 18 years I have been reading treatises, reports of scientific transactions and articles on Hertz wave theory to keep myself informed, but they've always impressed me of works of fiction. Energy matter equivalency, as propounded by the relativists, serves to distort the proper understanding of the continuity of energy as represented by Heaviside. The false doctrines of the law of conservation of energy has a deleterious impact on the findings of Steinmetz and others that electrical energy can be synthesized. Relativism sought to eliminate the concept of electricity in its entirety through the denial of the concept of the ether and plunged science into a giant glut of platonic thinking and thereby established a type of religion called quantum mysticism. It seeks the creation of a spiritual entity such as a goddess in which they engender its framework of thinking. The influence, somewhat forceful, of the British thinking on science has been also a serious impediment upon the growth of electrical science. Foremost was the British Association establishing a distorted system of units, ohms, ferrets, and what have you, represent, representing electrical quantities. The effects were disastrous. Arbitrary factors such as 4 pi or the speed of light squared stuck to the electrical units like crap on shoes. The relativists took these parasitic factors which have no meaning in real terms and fabricated an entire way of thinking out of them. Heaviside used the phrase, the brain-wasting perversity of the British. Euler describes British thinking on gravity as, the English maintain that attraction is a property essential to all bodies, mutually to approach as if they were impelled by feeling. Other philosophers consider this opinion as absurd and contrary to the principles of rational philosophy. What was happening is, is the British were trying to say there was nothing in between the objects that attract, such as magnets, that it was purely the bodies themselves and space in between was void of any acting material, which has to be complete nonsense if you're going to deal with electricity. That's where the ether comes in. English natural, natural philosophers such as J.J. Thompson totally ignored the work of Americans such as Tesla. In fact, racial and national conflict played, played a major role in what would be established as scientific thinking. The way of France would rail upon the works of American Ben Franklin, the grandfather of modern electrical science. The French would enrage the English with their ideas on Newton, and hereby the English abandoned the ether concept for action in the distance and reprisal. Maxwell was to predominate over Helmholtz. The important works of Goethe and Steiner 
who came up with a completely complementary concept of electricity and matter and these things that the British, through Newton, were working on, were completely ignored by the British and Newtonian thinking. Even though the works of Steiner are extremely important in understanding certain electrical relationships. Racial mysticism, such as Nazism or Zionism, has given the world today a twisted nuclear thermodynamic science producing a divergent culture racing towards destruction. Scientists regarded the Maxwellian concept of the transformer of fantasy. In fact, modern physics representation of transformer action is the diametric opposite of that of reality. In the matter of heavy side, let us tell a story. The story is entitled An Explosion at the Shipyard. The USS Lucifer and need of repairs arrives at the shipyard. It is on an important mission to deliver nuclear bombs to Israeli military forces in Iran. Doc Electrician, a Mr. Young, came across a bag of meth that has not been seen in days. Substation transformer feeding the dock is not completely connected, and the USS Lucifer needs its power now. Lieutenant Junior Gray Einstein and Master Chief Electrician's mate, Heaviside, look at the transformer and find the pairs of secondary windings not completely connected. The work only partly completed by Mr. Young. Master Chief Heaviside, still sick from last night's liberty, heads for sick bay. He sends Seaman Lopez, who was recently demoted for fighting with blacks in the engine room, to assist Mr. Einstein. Seaman Lopez fancies himself as a real hotshot and is eager to jump in to assist Lieutenant Junior Gray Einstein. Mr. Einstein, having never seen a transformer, asks Seaman Lopez if he knows the connections are. But Lopez replies he's never seen a split winding transformer before. Now, Mr. Einstein, an MIT graduate in physics, remembers his Maxwell equations, which tell him, in his mind, that the induced EMF on the driven windings x1 and x2 must be out of phase with the induced EMF in the unconnected winding x3 and x4. Thusly, Mr. Einstein tells Lopez to connect x1, x4, and x2 to x3. Lopez balks, feeling this may not be correct. Remembering back to electrician made school, Mr. Einstein orders Lopez to make the connections of the poor culture for his fighting in the engine room. But Seema Lopez is not stupid. Mr. Einstein explains the superiority of MIT education over naval EM school. The connections are made. Lopez closes the switch by praying to the Virgin Mary. Everybody's killed in the blast. That is where electrical engineering exists today. Sadly enough, heavy side laments. The question is, is what now is to be done? Are we modern pygmies who, by looking over the shoulders of the giants, can see somewhat further than they did to go on perpetuating their errors forever and ever and even legalizing them? Upon the general acceptance of Einstein's relativity, Oliver Heaviside painted his fingernails pink removed all the furniture from his house and slept on a block of stone and wrote no more. Okay, that's the completion of the first part. Are there any questions? Okay. So now we're going to get into basically what Steinmetz is about and this engineering and mathematics that I'm going to present here. So Steinmetz came up with called the symbolic method of electrical representation or what's known as the Steinmetz method. Engineering basically is built on mathematics and science, so we have to concentrate a little bit on what mathematics and science is about. Heavy science states that science begins with measurement of quantities. Mathematics is reasoning about quantities. Heavy science states electrical engineering deals with electrical energy and its flow, that is, electric power. Electrical engineers can be described as the goal-oriented utilization of the principles of mathematics and science. Theory must follow experience. Tesla complains that a spell cast by delusive theories has worked harm into the proper understanding of electricity. Heaviside advocates a somewhat forceful approach towards the correction of this type of problem, stepping on toes as one goes on, which is basically the air of this particular talk I'm giving. This might be the conversion from Heaviside to Michael Savage. The quote heavy side, this seems strong language, but as Professor Tate tells us, that it is almost criminal not to know several four languages, which is a venial offense in the opinions of others. 
It seems necessary to employ strong language when the criminality is more evident. It must be severe and logical. This is why heavy slide was eventually banned from writing, at least for a while. But upon giving up, Tesla states, I am unwilling to afford to some small-minded and jealous individuals the satisfaction of having thwarted my efforts. These men are to me no more than microbes of a nasty disease. My project was retarded by nature and the world was not prepared for it. But the same laws will prevail in the end and make a triumphal success. I think you can see from the beginning of my talk that none of these people are very happy. Has anybody got that idea? If you mix Mike Savage and physics, that kind of gets the idea across. What's that? If you mix Mike Savage and physics, that does get the idea across. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get into Maxwell, Heaviside, and Steinmetz, and how the electrical process was picked up by them. For 2,000 years, as Mr. Whitaker tells us in his book, the attractive power of amber had been regarded as a virtue peculiar to that particular substance, or possessed by at most one or two more or two others. Amber being the where you rub the uh, the material and it picks up the little pieces of paper. The original electrical uh, experiences of the Greeks. Gilbert proved this to be proved this view to be mistaken showing that the same effects are induced by friction in a quite large class of bodies. A force which manifests in so many different kinds of matter seems to need a name of its own, and accordingly, Gilbert gave to it the name electric, which it has ever retained. So the birth of the word electric then became established in 1646 AD. Michael Faraday, in 1831, makes public his theory of an electrified ether consisting of polarized corpuscles forming tubules of electric induction. He begins the study of the analogies between emotional and statical electrical currents. Here begins the science of electricity. James Maxwell, in 1855, at the conclusion of Faraday's research and development of the continuous ether concept, sets out to construct a mechanical model of electrodynamic actions. He wrote, by careful study of the laws of elastic solids, the motions of viscous fluids, I hope to discover a method of forming a mechanical conception of this electronic state adapted to general reasoning. It has been said that Maxwell put the math to Faraday. The impact that Maxwell's ideas had on the emerging electric science was truly profound. Utilizing the recently developed ideas of Newton, Leibniz, and Hamilton, Maxwell produced a mathematical concept of electricity, one that stands to this day. Oliver Heaviside, in 1895, begins to publish a series of articles titled on electromagnetic induction and its propagation. Here, Heaviside develops what he calls electromagnetic theory from the Faraday-Maxwell point of view. By 1888, Heaviside was banned from publishing through the efforts of a Mr. Priest of the British Post Office Telegraphy Administration. Heaviside was called a disgrace to the Royal Society. However, Oliver Heaviside established electrical engineering as we know it today. Heaviside finds that the Maxwellian ideas are so cumbersome and overly mathematical that the mathematician himself, Heaviside begins development beyond the concepts of Maxwell. Heaviside states, what is Maxwell's theory? Or what should we agree to understand by Maxwell's theory? The first approximation to the matter is to say, there is Maxwell's book as he wrote it. There is his text, and there are his equations. Together they make his theory. But when we come to examine it closely, we find that this answer is unsatisfactory. To begin with, it is sufficient to refer to papers by physicists written, say, during the 12 years following the first publication of Maxwell's treatise, to see there may be much difference between the opinions of them as to what the theory is. It's seen differently and different by different men, which is a sign that it is not set forth in a perfectly clear manner and unmistakable form. There are so many obscurities and some inconsistencies. Speaking for myself, this is Heaviside speaking, it was only by changing its form of presentation that I was able to see it clearly, and so as to avoid the inconsistencies. Now, there is no finality in growing science. 
It is therefore impossible to adhere strictly to Maxwell's theory as he gave it to the world, if only on account of it being inconvenient in form. But it is clearly not admissible to make arbitrary changes in it and still call it his. He might have repudiated them utterly. But if we have good reason to believe that the theory, as stated in his treatise, does require modification to make itself consistent, and to believe that he would have admitted the necessity of the change when pointed out to him, then I think the resulting modified theory may well be called Maxwell's. This is where Heaviside began his 1,500-page book called Electromagnetic Theory, which is basically the icon of electrical theory and science. Everything today basically rests on it. Heaviside published his two-volume work called Electromagnetic Theory, it went to three volumes, in 1892. Here he developed his reconfiguration and extension of the Faraday-Maxwell concept of electricity. Most terms used by electrical engineers, such as impedance, find their origin in these volumes. Oliver Heaviside developed a complete and verified theory of propagation of electric waves on telephone and telegraph lines. The brilliance right out of abject ignorance met with harsh opposition. But when AT&T developed the first long-distance lines on Heaviside's theory, the voices of the opposition were silent and their noses went high. While the Maxwellian concepts of Oliver Heaviside found institution in the telephone and telegraph industries, there were certain difficulties in the application of these concepts to the electric power transmission systems, particularly with regard to waves and transformers. By 1900, Charles Proteus Steinmetz had presented his theory of versus operators, versus operators, to replace the cumbersome differential equations utilized by the followers of Maxwell. Steinmetz was severely criticized, notably by Michael Pupin, who had glommed on to heavy sized principles for AT&T, never mentioning Oliver, of course. However, Steinmetz's method was now a resounding hit amongst electrical engineers who now could forge ahead with Tesla's new system of alternate currents. This mathematical methodology thus allowed the extension of Tesla's AC technology throughout the world. Steinmetz quickly became an ultra icon of the United States of America. Heaviside had begun the development of a similar line of thinking 30 years earlier with what he called his impedance operator. This concept, while replacing differential equations, was still too cumbersome for electrical engineers. In addition, it was Maxwellian. The Steinmetz method, being specialized for continuously alternating waves, was of such simplicity that one may get the feeling of cheating or such. In the corporate world that Steinmetz worked his concepts of Versa algebra in, as it is called, let's see, I think I see something here. Never could advance, he could never advance it as far as he might take it. The companies were not interested in that, they were interested in machines. While attending a paper presented by Michael Pupin on the Tesla induction motor, Steinmetz remarked that the differential equations made it too mathematical for practicing engineers. He quickly sketched on the blackboard his complex number theory which was simpler mathematically and also accounted for the losses. Not possible in Maxwellian terminology. Upon finishing, Steinitz was criticized for not using Maxwell coefficients by Pupin. Steinitz disliked the Maxwell approach because the coefficients of mutual inductance were expressed in a combined form as one magnetic field, where in actuality, in transformers, they exist in two fields in what Steinitz calls the mutual flux and the leakage flux. This conception is of utmost importance and serves as one of the main themes of this paper. So Steinmetz was given credit for being allowed by his employer to create electricity from the square root of minus one. And this is where we enter the basic theory of the talk. Is it possible to synthesize electrical energy? So a Vladimir Karapatov, professor of electrical engineering at Cornell University, expressed that Steinmetz was allowed by his employer to create electricity from the square root of minus one at the eulogy of his death in 1923. This appeared in the Cornell Daily Sun on the 29th of October, 1923. Before the Steinmetz method, engineers had used differential equations for graphics to calculate alternating current problems. <clears throat> With all the mathematical baggage aside, Engineers could see the alternating electric wave with crystal clarity. 
In this view, a few engineers knew that electrical energy can be synthesized, literally created along certain lines of, math of mathematical reasoning. At a lecture of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, in which Steinmetz, Tesla, and others threw their ideas back and forth about these, Professor William Anthony stated at the closing of the meeting that within one year they were going to have a self-sustaining electrical system that didn't need any fuel. This was in the 1890s. Where is it today? Steinmetz began a study of what's called synchronous parameter variation. The meaning of this is the variation of energy storage coefficients, such as inductance or capacitance or resistance, with respect to a point in time on the AC cycle, is the cause of what Steinmetz says, the lack is caused by what Steinmetz says, the lack of uniformity and pulsation of the magnetic field, causing a distortion of the induced EMF of open circuit as well as under load. The pulsation of reactants causing higher harmonics under load. He's speaking about generators and motors now. The